Hi, it's Stephen Thorne. I'm up next on Straight Facts, brought to you by BIA Media and Currency Entertainment. Straight Facts. Back at it again, you already know, so sign the cut. Yes, sir, and your boy Ace. And then today we have Stephen Thorne, who's won numerous national awards as a reporter, photographer, and broadcaster. Welcome to the show, Thanks, Steven. Fellas. It's an honor. Thanks to be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy is solid. Steve, uh, already problem solving for us. That's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be a good one. That was good. So, when did you first pick up a camera, and how did you get involved in the world of photography? Well, I grew up in the '60s, and my parents had uh, two picture magazines that really influenced my life and that was Life Magazine which is a weekly and National Geographic and I used to pour over those magazines and it was a rare, very stormy time in the 60s you know the yeah. Vietnam War was going on there were assassinations in the states and a lot of uh, unrest and uh, so I was sort of captivated by that yeah. and uh, I think I I just was swept away in that world and I always aimed to I always wanted to shoot photography and, overall uh it turned out that i became a writer as well and I, it worked the two work it works hand in hand right yeah in that sense because yeah. a picture could practically give you like a thousand words right so that's the truth so it does definitely yeah. i would imagine and do you remember your first shot and what was it clear as a bell clear as a bell <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I grew up in Halifax, and we used to, my grandparents were Prince, right? Prince Edward Island, mm -hmm. and uh, we used to go over, over on the ferry. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember if we were coming or going, but I asked my dad if I could take a picture with his camera. Right. And he, so he handed me the camera, and I took a picture of him right. and my mom. Now, if I've still got that picture, I don't yeah. know. Uh -huh. I've got, he used to shoot slides. And yeah. I've right. got all the reels. Mm -hmm. So it's there somewhere, but I think that one experience of, of taking right. a picture sort of captivated me and when, growing up I was always going around with a camera shooting with my mm -hmm. friends and yeah. experimenting and stuff I had a little brownie star camera and uh, right, right. Uh, you know I'd take film in every week to the uh, the drugstore up the street and there was a pretty lady behind the counter I was oh. about her, <laughs> Look at this guy. so uh, yeah it was uh, it just became part of my life and uh, I got hired when I was 14 uh, Brian Heaney was coaching the St. Mary's Huskies basketball team, and mm -hmm. he hired me as the team photographer. And uh, Huskies, uh, which uh, which um, sports is that? Uh, basketball. Basketball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they were they and Acadia uh, were big rivals. And, oh, okay. Uh, they, CIS. Yeah, and yeah. they had huge uh, crowds by Halifax standards. Yeah, yeah. They'd pack the Halifax form every. I've been there every weekend. In 2019, I told yeah. you I went to Halifax. I've been there. Yeah. It was packed for yeah. the tournament and for the nationals. Yeah, yeah. they loved it, and then yeah. they hosted the nationals. For yeah, years. They did. They yeah, they did. Yeah, and when I was, you know, when I was a teenager, um, they'd have uh, double headers. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the early game would be Dal and Saint of X. Yeah, and the late game would be uh, Acadia and Saint Mary's, and I'd be down on the court underneath the hoop shooting. And there'd be 10,000 people at those games, which was big for Halifax at the time. And uh, just loved it. You know? It must have been quite the experience. Yeah. Yeah. When did you realize that you wanted to do photography full time? Like, was it after that experience overall? Well, you know, when I, st when I learned to read and write, I started writing. Mm -hmm. And I still got stories that I wrote when I was seven or eight years old, I guess. Um, and I just... I did some did some work through school, mm -hmm. uh, you know. I was shooting all through school for for money, but uh, when I was in uh, university, I did stuff for the paper and for the uh, school paper. And then the uh, public affairs department got in touch with me and said right. that, that Halifax Herald needs a stringer down here to cover sports. So I covered football, hockey, basketball, and stuff for the for the paper mm -hmm. my last year at Acadia, and then they hired me. So that's, that's a big achievement, definitely, definitely. And how have your experiences, you know, growing up in Halifax influenced, you know, your work um, or, you know, your work process? It was uh, when I, I spent three years at the Halifax Herald mm -hmm. and I basically did whatever I wanted there. Yeah. It was Free great. Rains. I, I, yeah, I, uh, 
I got to be a, a feature writer and yeah. fit, uh, doubled as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to a point where I w wasn't learning stuff there yeah. anymore. I wanted to go someplace where I could learn more. And so I got a job at the, a the wire challenge. service. Yeah, new challenges, uh, new people around me, new mm -hmm. editors and stuff that could right. teach me more. So I started at the, uh, at the Canadian Press in 84, I guess it was, mm -hmm. and I was there for 30 years. And where was that? That was started in Halifax. So I moved around the country with them. I was okay. in St. John's, Newfoundland for two years, and mm -hmm. Toronto for a couple of years, and yep. then back in Halifax for a decade, and then up here. Up here. So. Very good. Were there any outlets uh, in which you would channel your creativity through before immersing yourself in photography? Sports. Yeah. Yeah. I played, I played, I started out playing hockey and then I was playing hockey and basketball. It was too much. So I just stuck to basketball. <laughs> oh, you're balling. You know? Yeah. I was oh, balling. Oh, got a ball that's getting <laughs> yeah. back there. Yeah. Man, and, you uh, got someone I can cross you over, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Painful. And I, uh, I love ball. Yeah, I played probably four to five hours a day. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it was great because it took me places and I met people and got to know people mm -hmm. that I would never have gotten to know otherwise. Right, got, right, right. Got to know otherwise. And, uh, you know, I loved it. I loved ball. But I, I wasn't big enough and I wasn't, I didn't work hard enough. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. No, that's great. And how was your upbringing, you know, shaped uh, your creativity? Uh, my mom was very artsy. She, was, I, she was a frustrated actress. Oh yeah? Yeah, she, was, she, yeah. Was actress. she wanted to be an actress? And, and she was a pretty good writer. She, okay. she did a, her bachelor's degree at Mount St. Vincent University when she was in her 70s, I think she would have been. In arts? Yeah. She was their oldest graduate. Uh, and How old was she? She was, I think she was in her late 70s, maybe oh, early wow. 80s. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And she had to do a lot of writing for that. And I up. don't have the stuff she wrote, but I've seen some of it got published. I've seen that. Really? Mm -hmm. And uh, just, she was a great writer. She really was. And uh, I don't know, my dad always read to me at night. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my mom exposed me to the arts. She'd take me to concerts and stuff yeah. and plays. And I hated it at the time, yeah. but I appreciate it now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was so, definitely an experience. And yeah. talk about your dad, you know, I know we're talking about that off camera. Yeah. Like, talk about your dad. Well, he was a doctor, and he, right after he became a doctor, the Second World War started, and he joined the Air Force and went overseas for, he married my mom, and I think within a, about three months, he was overseas for three years. Wow. That's, that's and time. when I was a kid, uh, there were these, there was this album that he had kept during the war of photographs that he had taken during the war. And I'd just spend hours pouring through that. Yeah. You know, it was one of those ones where the pictures are all overlaid. Yes, they, sir. You know, and you're flipping through them like that. And uh, he was, he always wanted to document everything, you know, yeah. like go on picnics or family trips or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was always taking pictures. I'm sure that must have influenced me somehow. And, uh, and just, you know, in school, it was kind of my escape. It was the one thing in school I really loved to do. And I, I guess I must have excelled at it when that was writing, you know, yeah. like I'd get into telling stories and writing mm -hmm. stories and stuff. And, and, uh, I, I've got one at home that I wrote, I don't know how old I was, but it was, uh, it was a, a retelling of a story that my dad had like read me mm -hmm. and it was called the original story was called the war whoop of the wily iroquois and mm -hmm. it was about a frontier family right you know and and uh and their encounter with iroquois indians and uh and i rewrote this thing from memory like i told my own version of this story right. how old were you when you yeah. retold you oh, yourself God, like when you originally seven you know something like that i couldn't spell very well right right and then, so my version was called well not, that's what i'm thinking about I, my version was called the war whoop of the willy iroquois <laughs> right and and there were a lot of hilarious misspellings mm -hmm. in there and and yeah it's i can stuck only with you, imagine definitely. Well, go ahead. yeah i was just gonna say it definitely stuck with you right so yeah 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 it's a you know writing is uh there are two different things. And I went through times in my life after I left CP, I was kind of five years of freelancing and I didn't do a lot of shooting. I did a lot of writing, but mm -hmm. I felt this void, you know? Right. Yeah. And when I wasn't writing a lot, I felt, a, or, but I was shooting more. I felt mm -hmm. the void. Yeah. 
so um, it's kind of my yin and yang, I guess. It's uh, I like to do both, and they each one has its. They complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. How would you? Um, I was going to ask. How would you describe your creative process overall? I don't know if there is one. It's, just, it's a matter of observation because I'm a photojournalist yeah. primarily. It's a it's a creative process. Uh, it's a it's a, a matter of observation. Yeah. It's the creative process is something that grows out of what's happening in front of you. Yeah, you just got to be there what, at the right time. What you can do with it and how it, you can best depict what's happening in yeah. front of you. It's not something you can manipulate. And it's a funny thing because for a while I shot models. I did fashion and beauty photography for about five years. Mm -hmm. And it was a real difficulty for me to to manipulate images. Yeah. To, to say, okay, you stand this way, look that way, and mm -hmm. move this over here and move that over there. And, and it was like, you know, when I first started, I'd look at a picture. I go, well, why did I leave this there? <laughs> you know, some lamp or something yeah. that was sticking yeah. out of her. And, and it. And it's just... Uh, it, it was a great exercise. I learned about lighting. I learned about so kind of how to manipulate the yeah. picture. Yeah, mm. and I learned a lot about just communicating with people and right. collaborating with people, yeah. not just artistically, but uh, you know, work-wise, and just getting. I met so many people. You know, I met girls from all over the world. Right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Manny wants, Manny wants to be you right now. They were all way too young for me. <laughs> oh, stop it, stop it. They're like the OGs. Um, but, uh, Stephen, let me ask you, what has been the best experience in your career, you know, so far? Wow. Well, this is going to sound kind of weird, but... I, you know, a lot of people go into journalism. They want their their goal in journalism is to be like a national pol political reporter, a big a, shot, a columnist, or they want to write about the economy and and uh, stuff like that. Or major league sports. Um, I never wanted to do sports. I love sports too much mm -hmm. to work at it. Um, I always thought that the pinnacle of a, a journalist's career would be to to be a war correspondent. Mm -hmm. and so I did you know I did that and I remember thinking I was in the middle of a firefight and I remember thinking this is it wow. this is everything I ever thought I could do or wanted to do and, and uh, was, you know <laughs> my career went downhill after that <laughs> you know it's just like I wouldn't say that but uh, it, it's uh, it was it was a heck of an experience I did 10 years of war or 10 years of um, disasters and 5 years of war and after that, I had PTSD. I was going yeah, to ask you, is it too sensitive to ask, right? Yeah. No, no, I don't mind talking about it. I think it should be talked about, and it helps to talk about it. And, you know, I, just, uh, I was just a wreck. You know, I lost marriage, crumbled, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a price that I paid for mm -hmm. what I, doing what I wanted. Dedicated to, to being dedicated to your career? Yeah. And, you know, it was few years in the wilderness and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. came out the other side and happier than ever been in my life right now so you think every f photography journalist out there wants a position like that or is it well sought out like what to be a war oh. correspondent yeah. correct no because i know people who said no <laughs> when right. they were asked if they wanted to go you know yeah. Few, yeah. i've had people tell me they wouldn't do it but you know, it's it's not what you think it is when you get there. Mm -hmm. The thing that I took away from Af Afghanistan, especially, were yeah. were the people, uh, how resilient they were, mm -hmm. how uh, how must be devastating. Yeah, for them. yeah. I mean, there's nobody there that must hasn't. Be pretty tragic. When I was there, they'd been they were in their fourth decade of war, and mm, that's tough. Um, you know, I know some of the guys that I've been shooting playing ball have come from countries that. that have been warring for years and i just you know there's not a person in afghanistan that hasn't been touched in some way they're they're you know 100 people a month were dying dying or maimed by landmines at the time i was there there were people who lost family members and and so on so and yet they continue they press on and yeah. it's just it, it was a very difficult transition for me when i i'd come back none of what i saw in terms of firefights and stuff 
bothered me as much as coming back to this culture and seeing how entitled people feel, how uh, they have this sense of su superiority or yeah. su sense of entitlement is the most First world problem. Yeah. It's the biggest thing that I I bothered me. I remember sitting in a in a uh, on a terrace with my ex and mm -hmm. looking at a guy at another table reading a newspaper he's just reading the newspaper drinking a, a latte and, right and i just looked at him and i was going look at that guy he said you know look, who the hell does he think he is you mm -hmm. know what has he ever done in his life what mm -hmm. has he ever sacrificed or lost mm -hmm. and it just i was almost got up and got in his face mm -hmm. you know and that, that yeah. was that was <laughs> at the peak of my yeah, yeah, yeah. ptsd kind of yeah, like, right you know and it, it was just you know, it was, it was a hard thing to deal with, a hard thing to uh, to kind of resolve. Right, it took years. And, wow, yeah. that's like it looks like it took a lot of courage and strength. Yeah. I don't know about the courage part. But. <laughs> <laughs> you make it look easy, Stephen. Yeah. You make it look yeah. easy, bro. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. So, um, what does a photograph mean to you in general? I love photography. I love photographs. There's uh, two brothers, they're twins, uh, the Turnleys, Peter and David, and uh, they're photojournalists. And they, they, for years, they covered wars and all kinds of strife all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was a big story, the, the word among the other journalists was that it was a two Turnley story. If they both turned up, right. that, was, that was the measure of a big story. Yeah, the, yeah. Two, twins, you know the, two, the twins were there. So now they, uh, they're American. But they uh, they also have French citizenship and they live most of the time in Paris, and they post every day. Peter gets up early in the morning and walks around Paris, goes to the cafes and stuff, and he does street photography. And I look, and it's all black and white. It's just beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. And I look at it every day, and I'm so inspired by it. It's just pe people having a coffee or lovers having a kiss by the Seine or something, you know. And, and it's just fantastic stuff mm -hmm. and then i look at what somebody like uh, uh james notchway who's a, one of my favorite photographers or uh, don mccullen uh, they were war photographers and uh and extremely good they didn't just take pictures they made profound pictures yeah stuff that you look at and you go wow you can't imagine that in the moment they find that image and uh you know uh, don mccullen's an older guy now i met him he had an exhibition at the national gallery here and and uh he he shoots landscapes now he, yeah, yeah. you know he's i you can tell he's he's it took a toll on his yeah, life i would imagine and uh but his pictures are just incredible mm -hmm. and so are so are uh, james notchways and there's a there's a handful of guys that, and women who uh, whose work is just very inspiring and I just I love to see how people tackle a story. There was a W. Eugene Smith was a Life magazine photographer and he was the, the they call him the father of the photo essay and he mm -hmm. would he would uh, do picture stories for Life magazine that were like 12, 16, 20 pages of just pictures and story you know laced with yeah. cut lines and and he did one on one called the country doctor and the guy looked just like my dad oh my goodness. and i actually went one time uh i went a couple of weekends with my dad on calls and took pictures of him right and do you think i can find that film <laughs> can't no oh, it's, that's uh, it's somewhere i'm sure you know i've got a bunch of roles that are undeveloped you're right and uh, i think that there may be some in there but i did develop some mm -hmm and uh but i can't find the negatives you keep everything like have you ever digitalized any of your old like pictures it makes me yeah think. i had yeah. some scanned and you know there's Seems such easier. a difference yeah, yeah. It's, well there's such a difference between uh digital and negatives and when you yeah. scan a negative the image looks so much nicer oh, wow. than yeah. an actual digital image really it's it's uh, something about film 
there's a texture to it and uh, the tones are different and no matter how much manipulation you do in in digital it, it just doesn't it's just not the it's same. just not the same yeah. right. it's amazing and how would you define your style <laughs> eclectic e okay uh, yeah. um, help us uh, dictionary <laughs> <laughs> work with me French my first okay. language <laughs> yeah I, I, I do a broad range of stuff I love shooting sports I love right. shooting the guys that are playing ball I love yeah. street ball I, yeah uh, you know um, I what I love to do and but don't get enough to do is, is street photography and and just photo essays projects and I'm doing photo essays for the magazine that I work for it's a military mm -hmm. history magazine but yes is it one of those magazines yeah it's yeah. this one here it's called okay. legion magazine legion magazine it's a military history the viewer magazine. wants to see what's going on over here it's an exclusive as straight fit <laughs> today so this one looks pretty cool um, yeah it's a like this Let's cover story is mine it's about uh mm -hmm. it's called the war off our shores which is My. it was the battle of the saint lawrence this and, one uh, yeah Okay, yeah. so, so that's these okay. are special editions. You can see they're okay. much bigger and so right. And you mentioned this one is one author. Uh, yeah, so I wrote that whole thing. Okay, and uh, we've got a great art department. They do terrific design and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that was about the U-boat war right. during the Second World War in the Gulf of Saint Lawrence, and yeah. how uh, German U-boats came right up the Saint Lawrence River and sunk sunk ships. Up right, there. sounds so, very interesting, very informative, yeah. very really good, interesting. How much are uh, one of the magazines? Uh, this baby right here is only five ninety five. Oh, this baby is affordable. <laughs> yeah, or, you, or you can subscribe for ten bucks. Oh. Right. And, uh, uh, online? Uh, yeah. It's an online Legion magazine. Or you get the magazine, a physical copy. Yeah. 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 And um, these babies here are fourteen ninety five. Yeah, yeah, they're a bit more robust. Yeah, so. they're better paper stock. They're bigger yeah. and they're more. Hey, paper uh, quality, right? Yeah. yeah paper quality <laughs> Can canadians in the battle of britain right that was uh <laughs> both wars that was the second world war it was 1940 and when hitler had defeated all of europe and mm -hmm, he yeah. overrun france and his yeah. next objective was britain and they held him off yeah classic stuff here yeah. so you've Press. captured a lot of history in your photographs oh yeah out of all the pictures that you've took uh, do any of them stand out uh, in terms of a memory or a story uh, that was particularly wild or interesting? <laughs> uh, I shot, there was one picture I took in South Africa. I went down for uh, Mandela's election campaign. Oh, wow. I didn't oh, okay. actually cover the campaign. Mm -hmm. I was there to just tell general stories that reflected on the changes that were taking place in South Africa. Yes. And... Uh, I had a drive a driver we call him a fixer mm -hmm. uh, they speak local languages they know their way around right and they they're like our eyes and ears mm -hmm. uh, wherever you go as a journalist you always have a fixer right and Noah was uh, he lived in Soweto and how do you recruit a fixer I always wonder well, that's, these that's documents how easier do you said than done <laughs> without an ad on GGG over there yeah <laughs> somebody you're, you're you're literally putting your life in their hands yeah and, uh, like in Afghanistan and I don't know it's just you know some of uh, Noah was older and just warm beautiful man and he and I clicked right away yeah and uh he lived in soweto he took me into soweto and all the he took me into shabines which are the local pubs that are actually in people's houses right. and all sorts of stuff and the picture that came out of that trip that i wasn't i hadn't been shooting for quite a while and it was my first overseas trip with the canadian press and uh i heard that there was going to be a rally of the uh african right-wing group they were called the AWB and they have a symbol that looks like almost like a swastika yeah. mm -hmm. three sevens mm -hmm. and the sevens represent the devil is three sixes well they're one up on the devil right that's why it's right. three sevens three sevens <laughs> okay and they they they're all uh, former mercenaries they fought uh, black rule in Rhodesia and uh, in Namibia and so on and so I, I just, you know, I, this is something I wanted to see from my own eyes because, mm. like, who are these people and what are they? And so Noah left me at a highway intersection 
where some general was going to pick me up. And, uh, and he, the general never showed. So I flagged down a car that was obviously these people mm -hmm. and they took me and they were like, they were all hillbillies. Mm -hmm. And I got to this thing and there were generals there and they were all dressed and they have big beards or Afrikaners. And, and, uh, this guy was in his fatigues, like mm -hmm. desert yeah. fatigues. And he had the battle cap. He had the three sevens yeah, that looked like the, just like a swastika. Yeah. And his daughter was there, this little blonde haired, pale skinned, blue eyed kid. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of leaning against him for this picture. He had his arms around her and she was wearing a white pink polka dot dress mm -hmm. against this desert cam. Mm -hmm military uniform and she was so sweet and innocent and he was so threatening right and that day was a real eye-opener for me because mm -hmm. a very emotional day because I my dad had talked so much about the war the second world war and how they defeated Hitler and you felt like you know that kind of thing is gone from the world i was a still you know i was a young still a young journalist at the time yeah, relatively mm -hmm. young anyway and uh i thought that you know i thought that this stuff was going gone from the world and yeah. here was this parade they paraded through town this town yeah and the streets were cleared you know you didn't see a native african anywhere and they had a rally and stuff and and I had a, quite a conversation. I got a ride back into Johannesburg with one mm -hmm. of these generals, and he talked. What was their mindset yeah. at the time? Oh. Keep it. Uh, they keep were going to straight were gonna, facts over here. Keep it raw. <laughs> yeah, well, educate us. Yeah, they were going to uh, resist. Um, you know, they were going to resist black rule in South Africa. And I think it was about a month or two after I got back. Yeah. Uh, some of those guys that I'd met were killed in an ambush. Oh, wow. Really? And, um, yeah, I mean, this guy talked about, he talked about African, African killer bees. And he said, you know, uh, we don't want other strains of bees to dilute the African killer bee. And, it, and you know, he extrapolated that this was this was the justification for apartheid mm -hmm. this was the kind of justification for keeping people separate right and it's just you know you, you can't believe it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you can't believe what's going on in america today it's, it's just you yeah. must have yeah. absolutely that's insane. my point. must have seen so many points of views throughout your career yeah. you know i even read your bio you you've been around talibans you've been around terrorists you know yeah. people that people would be shook to be around yeah yeah you know yeah like yeah. and you kind of got to stay neutral i guess right i'll tell you in afghanistan well, i had a house like a, a compound and i had two mm -hmm. mujahideen guards with their ak's and i had a, a fixer and uh my fixer said to me he, my fixer was really well connected and he said do you want to have some people over for lunch i said okay you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and at the time the base was getting uh in south of Kandahar was getting shelled. It was 2002. It was only months after two, the 9-11. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, the, the, yeah, there were these rockets coming into the base all the time. I actually got knocked over by an explosion one day when I was on the phone with my office oh, in Toronto. Damn. And uh, so he said, well, let's have these guys over, you know, and I said, great, uh, let's go. So we had the guys over. We have a really nice lunch, like, that's the Taliban's. Ahmed knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know they were Taliban. And I interviewed one of them and I right. said, you know, what is, where are these rockets coming from? Yeah. And he tells me the whole thing. He says, well, we, they've got guys here and they've got guys there. And, Breaking you know, it down. To uh, and I got a good story out of it. And it wasn't until, I don't know when, I said to my fixer, were those guys Taliban? And, yeah, and um, yeah, that must have been drippy. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. Yeah, to say the least, right? <laughs> uh, what was it about the people um, you photographed in Afghanistan that stood out to you the most? What I do is like 
when I was in Kabul, a couple of years I was in Kabul, um, I'd go out, at the end of the day, I would go to a market with my fixer and driver. I had a fixer and a driver at that time. And we'd walk through a market and I'd say, you know, 20 minutes. We only stay in one place 20 minutes because yeah. word would get around you there and you don't know what's going to happen. So, and they would watch for me. They would, one would watch forward, one would watch back. It's always on alert. Yeah, and I'd walk through the market and what I'd do is I'd raise my camera, I'd look a guy in the eye, I'd get his attention. I'd look him in the eye and kind of give him a kind of a nod yeah. and he'd nod back. And I learned that that's, there's this communication you can have with people without speaking a word. Not terrible. And then I'd raise the camera and either the guy would go on doing what he did or give me a look. And, uh, and it was, always came out a good picture. Um, I think what struck me about Afghans were they were a long suffering people, but they were willing to make sacrifices to get their story to the rest of the world. They knew that I was there. And that was part of my role in being there. Tell their story. And they, they tell their story. They, yeah. yeah. And that they always, I almost never said, were, was confronted with a no. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, what do you hope the response is for the viewer that sees your work overall? I think any journalist, their hope is that they open people's minds. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Somehow they'll help engineer a change, no matter how small, uh, that they can affect one life. There's a story that I wrote about a, a medical team that went to a small village in northeast of Kabul, and the kid, there was a kid there who was dying. I wrote a story about him, and somebody in Canada ended up doing a fundraiser, and they brought him to Canada and fixed him. Really? Wow. Yeah. Off a story. Yeah, and now he's, <laughs> now he's, this is 20, 20 years later, he's in hiding in mm -hmm. Afghanistan and trying to get back to Canada. Mm -hmm. so. Damn. Not to sound egotistical like Kanye West, but when you see situations like that, you feel some type of power. You know, that sometimes they'll have people that like, you know, they'll be trying to get a story out and they need the co cooperation of, you know, writers and photographers, right? You feel humbled. I always felt humbled, you know. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, just the blessing of getting what you wanted or getting what you needed to get the story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is a blessing that all the things fall down in the right places and, and people trust you enough to tell you their story. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. Free yeah. to capture the moment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. and how do you know when it's the right time to catch, capture a picture? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I get a hard time from some people because I take a lot of pictures. Yeah. Well, I can imagine, like, you're talking about, the, you talk about some of your favorite, you know, photographers, and then you see some of them, what they can find in the scenery. This so, so, sometimes, like, there's so much action going on. Yeah. How do you pick, right? Yeah, I think you rely on your intuition and your senses and what moves you, and you hope that what moves you will move people. Yeah. And so, yeah. you hope that it's able to convey a, yeah. a message. Yeah, like I went into a children's hospital in Kabul, and it was just like you couldn't turn in any direction and not see something that moved you. Devastating. It's hard to look yeah. away. Yeah. 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 So, what equipment do you use? I've been using Canon since 1980. Oh, is there oh a Canon here? Yeah. Never stopped. <laughs> Never broke from Canon. I wow. started with Olympus. That was what my dad used. Yeah. And, uh, and I traded my stuff all in at one point in, when I was in university and got Canon gear and I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you feel they've adjusted a lot with like the new technologies and like... I'll tell you, these new cameras are, it's uh, this uh, mirrorless stuff that you went, you went from 14 frames a second <laughs> to 30 <laughs> frames a second. Yeah. Right. And it's... Uh, shooting basketball you know shooting sports i shoot some polo it's unbelievable mm -hmm. and I, I never think to uh to change the the speed yeah so if i'm shooting portraits <laughs> I'll, I'll shoot off like 15 frames just like that yeah you know which is okay because you get subtleties in expression that uh, you know 
that make or break a photograph. Right, 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 right. Sometimes it's tough to to time a certain expression, I guess. And uh, what is a moment where you were unable to take, you know, portraits that you wish you could have have? Oh, man. I don't know. Uh, uh, Give the hard one that's straight facts. (laughs) Yeah, there's been, you have nightmares about that. You have nightmares about, like, when I was shooting film, you'd have nightmares about taking pictures and then not having film in the camera. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a, a thing in Afghanistan where I needed storage. And a guy got, picked me up a, a, a drive in Kabul. And I put all my pictures, I put about 10,000 pictures on there. And I only had on my computer, I don't know how many, just the, edit, just the edits. And that drive crashed. I mm. lost 10,000 pictures. Oh, that's crazy. I just finished two weeks of shooting mm. child labor. In Kabul. That's brutal. All gone. Wow. And that's a touchy subject, too. Yeah. Could have yeah. done a lot of, for, Yeah. I don't know. So much movements gets done from, you know, when it's a child about children and, you know, just it, it touches people, right? Yeah. So what happened? Like you didn't redo the story? Uh, I was just before I left. Right. So I was scheduled to leave. So And I'd been there for over five months at the time. Mm-hmm. That's brutal. I was pretty anxious to get home Yeah. and just devastated at that yeah. loss, you know. Yeah. So, can you talk about the business side of photography and how hard or easy is it to make a living off photography? It's hard. It's hard? Yeah. Speak on and, that. Uh, I wouldn't have ever made a living just off photography, I don't think. Um, it's kind of writing is actually my meat potatoes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the whole industry, journalism, has changed so much in the last 20 years that... Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's not a, as an attractive an option, not a practical option mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Uh, I tend to think that journalism schools often, not often, but sometimes turn out uh, products that are less. They're more robotic. They're they're not. They forget that there's people involved and feelings and and subtleties in communication that can make a journalist a better journalist or a great journalist as Mm -hmm. opposed to an average journalist um i think like i didn't i didn't even graduate university i was one credit shy of my degree right and uh i went straight into the workforce uh, working for the halifax herald Mm. Uh, i was lucky but at the time journalism schools were just sort of gaining momentum I think they, they took a step up and okay. and uh, I, so my career and a lot of careers that I knew uh, were, uh, were a series of apprenticeships with really talented, knowledgeable and experienced editors who would teach you. And I had, I, there are probably three or four people in my career that really shaped my, my career mm-hmm. and uh, I credit them with you know <laughs> yeah no no that's sometimes it's enough just enough you know yeah. um one of our goals you know at straight facts is to inspire youth you know to pursue their dreams right yeah. so what advice would you give you know someone who would like to become a photographer yeah. today i'm a great believer in pursuing dreams i pursued mine and it's the photography side of my career was never a practical thing for me. It was a love. I invested a lot in camera equipment that I couldn't afford. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it, it brought me to a place where I had something more to offer my employers and, and prospective employers and so on. And I think that if you really believe in what you're doing, if you love what you're doing, if you just pursue it and don't, you know, money, make enough money to live, but don't expect to get rich. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough, competitive business. Newsrooms have been cut really badly. Right. And, uh, you know, there, there are a fraction of the people in newsrooms today that there were mm-hmm. 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's a big adjustment, uh, digital, uh, the internet and so on. 
the transition from print to to digital is just been a really uncomfortable thing especially for the newspaper industry yeah i can i can imagine you know you talked about the big names you worked for now there's so much freelance journalists out uh, journalism you know it makes me think about you know the evolution you know when you talk about that yeah Yeah, it's uh it's a challenge but there are so many opportunities the kind of thing that you guys are doing it's fantastic uh kids can create their own world of of media of in with podcasts with uh, online with you know websites Mm -hmm. and so on and it's it's a different world and i don't necessarily know everything about that world now but uh it's i really do believe in believing in dreams you have an ig you have instagram I used to, but I never used it. So, <laughs> never used yeah. it. <laughs> so it's there, but I, I, yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah, no worries. A photographer. I gotta ask. So, yeah. what will uh, your work? What will you work on next? And where will your camera take you? <laughs> I don't know where my camera will take me. I'm hoping to go to Africa at some point, and uh, I, I do a lot of wildlife photography too. So I'd like to do I'd like to do some things with that, but um, I'm writing another one of these special editions on uh, the Korean War. So mm-hmm. right now I'm photographing. I'm doing portraits of Korean War veterans that are all in their 80s, mostly in their 90s. Yes, we're talking about that off and, camera. Yeah, and uh, I've gotten back to studio work uh, doing that, which is uh, it's been a few years since I've actually worked in a studio. So mm-hmm. I'm getting used to uh, some new lighting and. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Yeah, no, it's great because you're always learning. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd never worked magazines until 2016, and then that's a whole new world. It's mm-hmm. completely different than newspapers, so I'm learning all the time. Yeah. Sounds like you got your hands full. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's straight full fact. <laughs> that's <it's not> <laughs> too full. That's straight fact. Thanks for coming, Stephen. It was an honor again. Yeah, thanks, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Ha 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 ha